It's icy out here today, baby. Hello guys and gals, Buffalo here. Welcome back to the range. Today, we're taking a look at this Arms Corps Rock Island Armory AL-22 revolver. More specifically, the AL-22B, since this is the blued model, the AL-22 technically is the stainless steel version of this revolver. It's always fun shooting at that little three inch mini gong. So this is a 22 long rifle chambered revolver. It is a double action, single action revolver. Holds nine shots of 22 long rifle. And as a side note, it is available in 22 Magnum, but it has an eight shot cylinder. Okay, so before we get too deep into this video, I want to let you guys know up front that Rock Island Armory doesn't actually manufacture this revolver. It, they import it. You can see I've got it loaded up with snap caps there. We'll take a look at some of the markings on this revolver. On the right side, the only markings on it are up here on the barrel shroud. We see 22LR. On the left side, we can see the Rock Island Armory import logo. We can see Arms Corps Precision International, Pahrump, Nevada. And below that is the actual manufacturer. It says Alpha Proz, Czech Republic. So this gun is actually made in the Czech Republic. It says model AL22.0. But Alpha Proz has been, or Alpha Project, has been producing revolvers since the 90s. And they've been imported by different importers here to the U.S. But I think this deal they've got with Rock Island Armory is really going to put them on the map, really going to showcase their revolvers, at least here in the United States. They're probably, they're probably already well represented in other places. But they haven't been that well represented over here. They're not that well known. Now this is a all steel revolver. Comes in at 39 and a half ounces. It's about nine and a half inches long, 4.1 inches tall and an inch and a half wide. I'm going to try to cover this revolver as thoroughly as possible in this video. There aren't a whole lot of videos out there on this revolver. So we'll start by looking at the sights. They actually put a good set of sights on this revolver. It has a square notch rear sight. The rear sight is fully adjustable for both elevation. Here's your elevation adjustment screw. And windage. Here's your windage adjustment screw. The front sight is a ramp style front sight. It is pinned in place. And it's a steel sight, but it does have a little plastic insert. They put an orange plastic insert 
in that front sight to make it easy to pick up. And it is, it works well for that, as long as you're not shooting an orange target, I guess. But I do have one complaint with that, at least with my particular revolver, that tends to fall out. Actually, when I got this gun home, of course it's gonna be uh, stuck in there good now since I wanted to show it on video, but when I got this gun home, that little insert was running around in the hard case that this gun comes in like a free range chicken. I'll show you the the case while I'm talking about it here. It does come in this little hard carrying case, which is which is pretty nice. You can see the the numbers on it there. Nothing spectacular in this case. Basic lock, of course your paperwork, owner's manual, that sort of thing. But a lot of people like for them to come with these little carrying cases like that. It beats a cardboard box. But then again, I've heard other people complain that they would rather not pay for a case and they'd rather it just come in a cardboard box. So you can cut that both ways. It also had this target in the box with it. They shot this at 15 meters, nine shots. So they shot a full cylinder when they were testing the gun. And that's the group they got with it. Back to the gun though. A lot of detail here on the, on the revolver. Along the top of the barrel shroud here, we can see some serrations. Those are glare reducing serrations. Same thing along the tail of the rear sight here. And some vertical serrations along the base of the rear sight there. Little details like that are usually left off of your lower end revolvers uh, just to keep costs down. So I was glad to see that they did put some detail work into this gun. Just a real quick update. I epoxied that little plastic insert in place with this Gorilla Glue epoxy, this two-part epoxy, and it's not going anywhere now. It's in there good. So then I sat down at the bench and shot some paper targets just to make sure that my sights were still on. I'm shooting CCI standard velocity because, well, that's the ammo that I shoot the most of. So I want my sights to be aligned with the ammunition that I'm going to be shooting the most. Now, I wasn't in the mindset of shooting groups here. I was just doing a sight check. But the groups were good enough that I thought I'd share them with you guys because it does show that the revolver is, is plenty acceptable as far as accuracy goes. First, I set a target up at 10 yards, and then I set a target up at 20 yards. So here's these targets, if any of you guys wanted to see them up close. That's the one I shot at 10 yards. I measured 630 thousandths of an inch on that group with my calipers. And this is the one I shot at 20 yards, measured 900 thousandths of an inch. Now, since I measured those with calipers, you may be inclined to think that those must be pretty serious groups. They're not. Trust me, uh, take them with a grain of salt. I just wanted to show them to you guys because they... Uh, it does show that the gun will shoot and has potential, but I just came down here last night after I got off work. I had about a half hour of daylight to work with, and all I wanted to do was make sure that my sights were still on. So that's all I was doing there. So uh, you guys may have noticed the weather keeps changing. My clothes keeps changing in this video. 
and that's because I'm filming this over a span of about two weeks. I realized that I wouldn't wasn't going to be able to get a video out last weekend. So I went ahead and started on this project just to have something in the pipe. And I've been filming it, you know, a half hour at a time, coming down here, packing my cameras and stuff up, coming down here and getting a little bit of shooting footage and uh, talking about this revolver a little bit. So the video may seem a little splintered to you. If so, that's why. So back to the review here. It does have a four inch barrel. Now, I always consider the four inch barrel a very good all around uh, general purpose barrel. Good for anything from plinking to hunting to target shooting. The four inch gives you plenty of, of distance between the front and rear sight so that you can milk some good accuracy out of the revolver. This is a two piece barrel. What you're actually looking at here is not the barrel. It's a barrel shroud that surrounds the barrel. See it from the other side here. And the barrel is on the inside of this shroud. And they've done a really good job with this. If you didn't know what you were looking at, you wouldn't even realize that it was a two-piece setup like that. We're seeing more and more manufacturers using the barrel and shroud method of production on revolvers like this. And they do that in part because they can torque or press the barrel into place, set the forcing cone gap without having to worry about indexing the barrel. They don't have to worry about canted front sights or the lines not lining up properly because the shroud is a totally different piece than the barrel. And as you can see, the front sight is nice and straight. There's no cant to that front sight at all. In fact, the shroud has made it up to the frame dang near perfect. The right angles in the corners here look like they're supposed to. The serrations are nice and centered. They've done a good job here. I measured the cylinder to forcing cone gap. Here I have a 5,007 inch filler gauge. And here I have a 4,007 inch filler gauge. The 5,000th gauge will not fit between the cylinder and the forcing cone. The 4,007 inch gauge will fit a very snug fit. So 4,007 inch is actually a very good cylinder gap. You don't want to get much tighter than that because once you get a little carbon buildup on the face of the cylinder or on the forcing cone itself, you'll risk binding the cylinder. As for the barrel itself, it has six groove rifling with the standard for 22 long rifle, one turn and 16 inch twist rate. It does have a target crown. The shroud gives it the full under lug, making for a very beefy looking revolver. It reminds me a lot of the Smith & Wesson 617, at least in the general outline. And speaking of the 617. I've been carrying this in a holster made for a 4 inch Smith & Wesson 617. Fits the holster very well. Now I don't know if every K-frame holster will fit this revolver, but the softer ones, like this leather one here, uh, certainly do. Looking at these grips, they are rubber grips. They're very firm. They're not tacky at all like some rubber grips. They do have these little raised bumps on both sides. They help provide some traction. And of course, as you can see, they have the finger grooves molded in. I know some of you guys don't like the finger grooves. I don't, I'm not a big fan of them either, but I'm okay with them so long as they fit my hand. And these do fit my hand pretty well. I don't know of any aftermarket companies manufacturing grips for these revolvers right now. And maybe there are, I didn't dig into it that deep. But I'd like to see these revolvers get popular enough that 
the aftermarket manufacturers would see a payoff in their investment and go ahead and start offering grips for these revolvers. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with these, but you know, options are always good. I want to take a second to talk about the action of this revolver. You can see I've got it loaded up with snap caps there. It uses a transfer bar system, which means that the hammer can't make contact with the frame mounted firing pin unless the trigger is pulled, whether it be double action or single action like I just did. What that means is the gun is safe to carry, it's drop safe. You can carry it with all nine rounds in the cylinder with the hammer down over a live round and it's not going to fire unless the trigger is pulled or the hammer is cocked and the trigger is pulled. The timing on this gun is is really good. I can hear the cylinder stop pop into place just before the hammer locks back. I'm going to hold it right in front of my microphone here so that you guys can hear it hopefully. There was the cylinder stop and there's the hammer locking into place. I'll do that again. That's the cylinder stop popping back in place to lock the cylinder. And now the hammer's locked in place. So everything's happening in sequence like it's supposed to. The reason I mentioned that is I have gotten and documented here on my channel Smith & Wesson revolvers. Uh, one was a performance center revolver that didn't follow that sequence. The hammer would lock back and the cylinder was still unlocked. It was out of time. So I had to send it back and have them fix it. So timing is an important issue on these double action, well, any revolver. And this one seems to be in good time. The double action trigger pull comes in at 11 pounds, four and a half ounces. While the single action pull comes in at three pounds, 15 ounces. When I got this gun out of the box, the trigger was even lighter. It has a adjustment screw just beneath this grip. If you pull these grips off, there's a screw right in here, right on the side of the uh, side plate, that you can adjust the hammer spring. Most people automatically go in and try to lighten the uh, trigger. I added a little weight to it. When I got this out of the box, it was pulling right at three pounds in single action. Now I've got it up to almost four pounds. It's uh, three pounds, 15 ounces, as you just saw. The reason I did that is when I first got this gun out of the box and took it to the range, out of 100 rounds of CCI standard velocity, I had two light primer strikes. So what I did, I pulled the grips off and I turned the pull weight up just a little bit and I haven't had one since. So if you're getting light primer strikes or a lot of unusually, an unusual amount of duds, you might want to turn your trigger pull weight up just a little bit and you might put an end to that. I certainly did, so uh, just something to think about. Try a little single action. As far as fit and finish goes, I think they did an okay job. Uh, let me explain. The bluing is very thin on this revolver. Under certain lighting, it, it's more of a coal colored than it is uh, a gun blue colored, at least to my eyes. And there's some thin spots on it. Uh, if you don't keep oil on it, it gets kind of a gray coal look to it. The side plate, the side plate seam is very pronounced all the way, you know, where it matches up to the frame. It's got that wide seam all the way around. I'm sure that will turn some people off. But overall, I think they've done a good job balancing fit and finish with the action and stuff that they've put into this gun. 
fit and finish can add a lot of cost to a revolver uh, in the manufacturing process. If you spend a lot of time and energy in fit and finish, you're really going to raise the price of that revolver to the consumer, or you're going to have to cut corners somewhere else uh, to balance those costs out. I think they've done a really good uh, balancing act here of producing a presentable revolver with a decent fit and finish and a really good action in it. All right, I know this has been a very long video. Any of you guys still watching, I really appreciate you hanging out with me here at the range today. I do these longer format videos in hopes that it'll help somebody either making a decision on whether they want to buy one of these or maybe they've already got one and uh, maybe I can uh, teach them a little something about it. They'll learn something from one of my videos, who knows? But I get a lot of feedback from the longer videos. People seem to enjoy them, especially if it's on a gun that they're looking at, of course, or, or already have. Try to wrap this video up though. MSRP on this thing is $659 as of the day that I'm recording this video. In-store price is usually less than $500. I paid $484.35 for this one, brand new. So it's a sub $500 double action 22 revolver in the same size category as a Smith & Wesson K-frame. I think it's a good deal. From what I've seen, and I only have one sample here, I think it's a good deal. It's a very sturdy, well-made revolver. It doesn't have the best bluing on it in the world. You can see I'm already getting some holster wear here. Uh, maybe you can't see, but uh, pretty thin on the bluing. The plastic part of the sight fell out on my way home from the shop actually but the epoxy is, has held that in there it's it's not going to come back out just uh for the money for a sub 500 dollar k frame size revolver guys they had a smith and wesson 617 in that shop and i know the 617 I've, I've brought that revolver up several times in this video that's because it's my favorite uh 22 revolver and it's this almost identical size as this the same holsters work all that stuff but they had one of those in the shop for over $800. So a big price jump between from jumping from one of these to one of those. Yeah, that's my favorite revolver, but this is probably the better value. I can't say that I can shoot the 617 any better than I'm able to shoot this one. So if you're just looking for best bang for your buck, not the best thing that I can buy, this might be the choice for you. But uh, again, I'm going to try to close this video out. I'm going to stand here and keep rattling on if I don't shut up. So uh, just remember, guys, if anybody asks you to give up any of your freedom for the greater good, remind them that freedom is the greater good. That's all I got. I'll talk with you all again soon.